Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well, and I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for coming this morning to Lafayette. It's a good time to be together and to worship. Uh, we have a few announcements to make, and I just ask that you uh, be mindful and put these things on your calendar. So next Sunday, uh, August 21st at 4 o'clock, we'll have our quarterly conference. And uh, this is open to anyone, and we'll hear some reports from our teams and, and committees. So uh, it's, it's pretty important, and just want to share it with you all. Uh, we're going roller skating on Saturday, August 27th at the Roundabout. And, uh, and so uh, all families are welcome uh, for our kids and teenagers and even our older people who... Uh, oh, Dixie's not here. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's good she'll be there skating with us. <laughs> but, uh, but we just ask that you sign up so we know who all to expect and, and have an idea of, of how many tell them that, that are coming. Uh, Sunday, August 28th, is our big uh, LBC Children and Youth Promotion Sunday. Uh, I'll be sending out some more information this week, but there, there's going to be a change for their elementary age class where uh, first graders through fifth graders will be together, and then our uh, pre-K through kindergarten class will be together. So, And two, our sixth graders will be rising into youth uh, with the seventh through twelfth graders. So our volunteers have been putting in a lot of hard work and many hours to get things ready for all this, and we are truly thankful. I'll be starting a new Bible study series called Back to Basics, and this is going to be on Tuesday, August 30th at 7 o'clock. We'll be meeting in person uh, in our fellowship hall, as well as holding on an online version through Zoom. So uh, you'll be seeing some more information about that in the near future. And I came across this resource uh, through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of North Carolina that's called Faith Family Talks. I know uh, sometimes it's hard to find a good guide to uh, do a devotional with their families. And so this is just a small packet that works you through uh, the month of August. I know we're about midway through, um, but I have copies of these. So please come see me after worship if you're interested in this for your family. Also, for our youth, uh, we'll be going to uh, Fort Caswell for October uh, 7th through the 9th. It'll be a weekend trip for their youth retreat. Uh, it's going to be a great time, and I know we have some who are already signed up and ready to go. Uh, if you have more information, just uh, talk with Mr. Scott or uh, Mr. Mike Cox this morning for Sunday school. And I believe that is all the announcements I have to share. We've had people in our church who've been in the hospital and who've been sick. It is such a blessing to see Joe Jones back this morning. It's a blessing to have. It's a blessing to have Terry and Nancy Jackson back with us today. And, and, there, and I know both these families are just truly thankful for our prayers. I do have some other updates to share. Um, David Cole has been in the hospital this week, and I ask that you would be praying for him and Kathy and their family. Uh, and know, too, that there's many others in our church who have been sick, uh, dealing with COVID and so forth. Uh, there's just many uh, prayer concerns that we need to be mindful of today. Uh, Suzanne Cox shared with me before worship that her mom fell overnight, and so, Suzanne, we're continuing to pray uh, for your mom and dad. We all come here with many things that weigh heavy on us. We know of people who need our prayers. We know of those still in Kentucky who are dealing with all that they have lost. There are those around the world who need hope, especially through Christ. So in this moment, would you take time to pray? Perhaps you want to simply praise God for being here this morning to worship with friends, especially with our friends who have been sick and are now better. Would you pray for those who are still sick and who are going through rough days? And might we be mindful of those both in our country and around the world who need our prayers too? So join me 
in this time. I'll close this by a spoken word. Oh God, as we gather together to worship you, we are thankful for today, another day that you have given us. Lord, we are mindful of those who are sick today and who are facing things they never thought that they would. So may you be with them and lift them up. May you give them strength and may you help them hold on to the fact that your presence is with them all the way. Lord, we pray for those in Kentucky who have lost so much through something they had no control over. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are helping them even at this very moment and others who are preparing to help them. Lord, we pray for peace and for safety. Lord, we pray for those around the world who are going through things we can't even imagine. May you lift them up too and that they would know the love of Christ. And Lord, today we simply give you praise for those who have been sick and who are better, who can come and be a part of what we're doing today. We praise you for who you are, O oh God, always watching over us, always looking out for us and how you are continually with us in good days and in bad days. So we thank you for what you do through Christ, the one who gives us life. In his name we pray, amen. Please stand with us as we sing, How Great is Our God.
Come on down. We have permission to come down, so let's do it. Now, I'm not going to sit on the, on the steps because I'd never get up. So, all right, here's the, oh, just Mary Grace, where's Ellie? I don't know, okay. <laughs> Ellie, you don't want to come down here and see with, be with me? Help me out? You don't have to, but you can come if you want to. All righty. Can you hear me, Ellie? Can you hear me okay? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> now, guys, you're going to have to look at me and not them. There you go. Turn around so you can look at me. Your dad, Pastor Kevin, has been talking about the Ten Commandments all this last couple of months. Guess what number we're up to now? Number, do it twice. Eight, good. We're up to number eight. Number eight. And number eight is do not steal. What does it mean to steal? That's right. Take something that doesn't belong to you. Take something that doesn't belong to you. Now, why do you think people steal? Do what? She doesn't know. She doesn't know. I don't. Why do you think they, they steal? It's not very nice is right. Sometimes it's not very nice people. Sometimes it's nice people. They just get kind of carried away with the fact that they want something that belongs to somebody else, and I want it now, don't it? It means I'm more important than you are because I want what you have because it's more important that I have it. I want to tell you a story of something that happened to me when I was about your age. I was about five years old. <clears throat> My name is Carl, and I was named for my mom and dad's, one of their best friends, Carl Hanshaw was his name. So I was Carl. To make sure that they knew who everybody was, I named, my name was Carl Allen. Like yours is Mary Grace, and we got Karis Hudson, two names. Well, Carl Hanshaw would call me Carl Allen, and he was the only one that called me Carl Allen except for my mom when she was mad at me. And when she was mad at me, it was Carl Allen. So, but Carl Henshaw is the only one that called me Carl Allen. And we would go over there to visit them all the time when we lived in West Virginia. Well, one of my visits there in West Virginia, I was about five years old. <clears throat> I saw something on Carl Henshaw's desk that I thought was so cool. It was a letter opener that was shaped like a knife. And it was hand carved. And on the blade of the knife, it says, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. I thought, oh, that is so cool. I wish I had one just like it. And so what I did was, that night before we left the Henshaw's house, I took the knife and I put it in my pants pocket and took it with me. I took it home. I had forgotten that I even had it in my pocket until we got home, and I took my jacket off, and my mom found it. Guess what? Mr. Carl was in big trouble. My mom ended up calling Carl and Henshaw and telling him what I'd done, and she apologized on the phone. Oh, my son is so sorry he did this. Well, you know, the main thing I was sorry was I got caught. I was sorry that I did it, but I was mostly sorry because mom caught me doing it. Well... We were, I had to get on the phone, too, and say, Mr. Henshaw, Mr. Carl, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We were going to drive right back over to the Henshaw's house and give it back to him, except Carl Henshaw, the guy I'm named after, said to my mom, if Carl Allen wants that letter opener that badly, he can have it as a gift from me. Carl Henshaw showed me grace and mercy didn't he 
He showed me mercy because he didn't get mad at me, and he didn't say, well, that boy's never coming to my house ever again. And he actually let me keep the letter opener. He showed me grace, too, because he gave me something that I didn't deserve. He let, gave me forgiveness, and he let me keep this. Now, I tell you that story not to let you think that I got away with stealing something, because even though Carl Henshaw showed me mercy and grace, my mom and dad did not. <laughs> Mike Cox knows, West Virginia, you know. So I suffered the consequences of stealing something from somebody else. But I keep this as a reminder. That was when I was five years old. That was 65 years ago. And I've kept that as a reminder of that day when I stole something and somebody showed me mercy and grace. What is the opposite of stealing? If I, Stealing is taking something from someone and, that doesn't belong to me and keeping it for myself. What would be the opposite of that? Giving it, giving something to someone who doesn't have it and making it their own. Giving something of mine to somebody else and making it their own. So it would be sharing, wouldn't it? So the opposite of stealing would be sharing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this. Your verse today for you to remember is do not steal, but we're going to add a little thing at the end of it. Do not steal and do what? Share. Do not steal. Do what? Share. Good. Let me give you a verse. I have to read this verse because it's so long. But here's one of the ver verse that, that goes along with this. This is 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Some of you adults, if you want to look it up. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It's the book right after 1 Corinthians. <laughs> that helps a lot, doesn't it? God is able to give you everything you need and more so that there will not only be enough for your own needs, but also plenty left over to give joyfully to others. So God has said, you don't have to steal. I will grant all your needs. Matter of fact, I will give you more than you need so that you can share with others. So our, our story today is about do not steal and do what? Do share, that's right. So let's have a prayer. Let's have a prayer. Everybody bow your heads. Share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share his love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. Amen. Okay, go back and remember, do not steal, but do what? Share! That's right.
I encourage you to open your Bible with me to the book of Exodus, the second book of our Bible in the Old Testament. And we're going to be reading from chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. Again, that's the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. And I encourage you to read along with me and to listen with me to what these words have to say. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, You must have no no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above, or in the on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, But the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. May God bless the reading of his word. I've always loved to read. Now, granted, I didn't enjoy reading as much when I was in high school and college, but I learned real fast my sophomore year of college that whether I liked it or not, I had to read. Oh, man, when I was in the upper elementary grades, I would save up my hard-earned 50 cents a week allowance for washing dishes every night to go and buy books from the Walmart, or the bookstore at the mall, or best yet, when the school was having the Scholastic Book Sale. I look forward to those days. And I loved one series called the Goosebumps books. Anybody know about those or remember those? Okay. So I had all the books from volume 1 to 104, minus volume 14 that was about the werewolf. That really scared me half to death. (laughs) But before the goosebumps, I loved to go shopping with my mom with that hard-earned allowance and look for the great illustrated classics. It all started out with the Red Badge of Courage, And then that grew into the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and the adventures of Tom Sawyer. And before my third grade started in school, I remember buying the book, The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. And oh, I got really into Robinson Crusoe's story so much that I asked my mom, can I take my book with me to school? Because I knew there there was going to be a break in between work, and I figured I could keep on reading my book. And my mother said, sure, but let's get you a marker so you can write your name on the inside cover. So she gave me a permanent marker and I wrote my name inside. In third grade, we switched from Miss Joyner's class, my homeroom English and social studies teacher's class, to my other class for science 
and math about midday. And there was one day, it was right after school started, that we came back to my homeroom class, Mr. Warner's class, and I plopped down in my desk and I reached inside, just cheerful to read some more Robertson Crusoe before I went home. And I looked inside on the left and on the right, past my textbooks, and I couldn't find it. Then I looked in my book bag, and it wasn't there. I looked all around my seat and the desk. I scanned Miss Joyner's cla uh, classroom books on the sides of the class, wondering, you know, she thought it was one of hers. I didn't find my book. And so I raised my hand. And Miss Faison, her teacher assistant, who was a pretty stern lady, you know, she could give you that one look, and you knew she always meant business. She came over and she said, What is wrong? I said, Miss Faison, I can't find my book. And she said, I think I know where it is. Come with me. And so I walked with her to about three rooms down the door from Miss Dorner's room there on the left of the hall. And she beat on the door. The teacher said, what is it, Miss Faison? And Miss Faison budged her way in and walked right over to where a little girl was sitting in that class. And she said some words, and I was looking on. And I see the little girl pull my book out of her backpack. And so Miss Faison and the little girl walked to me, and she said, now you give him the book, and you tell him that you're sorry. And I didn't really feel all that good. Even though I got my book back, I was happy about that. But I didn't feel all that good about the situation. And I was thumbing through the book, and I got to that inside cover, and the little girl had took another marker and marked out my name and wrote her name in it. And I said, Miss Faison, will you look at this? And she said, you go on back to Miss Joyner's room, and I'll handle this. And as I walked back, I felt really horrible. even though I got the book back. As with most commandments, commandment number eight seems pretty self-explanatory. Do not steal. You shall not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Three simple words to keep us from taking what is not ours. All the ancient Near Eastern cultures and religions had rules against stealing. Some go so far as to call for chopping off hands of the thieves. Makes you wonder just how bad stealing was. Stealing is something that is certainly prevalent in our day and time as well. I'm sure we all have heard about the RF signal blocking wallets and purses where people can't walk by and steal your credit card information just by passing by with their phone. I'm sure you all have a lock on your house door and hopefully a deadbolt. When I went to college, they made a big deal about always locking your car door every time you got out of it, even if it was just for a quick run into the dorm and out, because they didn't want anybody to have anything stolen. That's a habit I still keep today. But there's also scholastic stealing called plagiarism. In one of my preaching classes, my professor shared how a pastor seemed to get really good at preaching his sermon overnight. Come to find out, he was stealing sermons online from another popular pastor and re-preaching the sermon without giving, uh, without acknowledging who it was from. When someone steals from another, it is truly an invasion of privacy. But it's also an invasion of security. If it happened to one person, we rightfully acknowledge it can easily happen to us. About a year ago, my neighbor across the street had his trailer stolen. 
The trailer was filled up with his lawn maintenance equipment and hitched up to his truck. And him and his family were home. My family and I were home. And it happened in the middle of the night, and neither one of us heard it. But you see, it wasn't just stealing my neighbor's material things. He has a lawn care business. And everything on his trailer was the way he paid bills, had a house, and provided for his family. After my neighbor shared with me what happened, I bought security cameras for my house the same day. My neighbor did the same thing. And thankfully, insurance worked out for him. Terrence Fretheim says this about commandment number eight. Theft is an attack on the dignity of human beings and their work. God dignifies human beings by giving them work to do from which they can expect to receive some of the fruits of their labor. This is central to God's creational intentions for humankind. Theft is a refusal to accept this. And hence, the humanity of both the thief and the victim is diminished. Moreover, human beings make use of God-given gifts in and through their work. For the thief not to consider these gifts and the blessings they bring is to treat with disdain what God has given. We hear all this and think to ourselves, but wait a minute, that's not me. I have not stolen anything. So why does this apply to me? In his book, Words of Life, Adam Hamilton shares about a conversation he had with a friend who is a rabbi. And the good rabbi and Hamilton were talking about this very same commandment. Thou shalt not steal. Hamilton said, You know, I can't really say that I've ever broken commandment number eight. Sitting across the table from Hamilton, the rabbi said, Oh, sure you have. Hamilton shrieked, How so? His friend shared how one of the biggest commodities in our lives is time. 24 hours, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. Then his friend asked Hamilton, how often was he on time for his meetings and appointments? Adam Hamilton is the pastor of a pretty large church in Kansas City, a well-written author and speaker and world traveler, all on top of being a, a husband and a dad and a grandfather. He's pretty busy. And Adam confessed that on many different occasions... He was late. His friend reminded Adam, we all only have a certain amount of time. Was it true that Adam was stealing minutes of one's life when he did not arrive at the agreed upon time? Ouch. The good rabbi is stepping on my toes, too. Stealing is when we take from others what is not ours to have. Stealing is when we diminish or dismiss another human being's dignity. Stealing it's when we rob a relationship of joy and love because we may not be totally honest with, the, with one another. Stealing is when one breaks the law and ornately believes they're getting away with it. Stealing is done when fair, honest wages 
are not paid, and huge corporations report their, lar their largest net profits from overcharging for their goods. Stealing occurs at one of its highest levels in the act of human trafficking. Stealing happens when one does not give the capacity to see someone else as bearing the image of God. Remember that story Jesus told about the rich man and the guy named Lazarus? Lazarus didn't have a thing, and he sat at the front walkway to the rich man's house. And every day as the rich man came and went, he had to step over Lazarus. And all Lazarus wanted was the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The rich man didn't give him anything. While the rich man was sitting at his table, eating, I'm sure, all kinds of food, he looked out with disgust from his window, seeing the dogs licking the sores on Lazarus' body. And he never did a thing about it. Come to find out, both these guys passed away at the same time. The rich man didn't make it out so well for eternity. And one day he looked up and could see Lazarus sitting with Father Abraham. And the rich man hollered out to Abraham, can't you send Lazarus to me to bring me a cup of cold water to cool me off? Abraham said, it doesn't work that way. And then the rich man said, well, have Lazarus go back because he needs to tell my family they've got to treat people better than what I did. They've got to do something to help others, to love others, to value them. Abraham said that they have Moses and the prophets. They have commandment number eight. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said, but as someone from the dead goes back to them, they will repent. Abraham said back to the rich man, if they don't listen to Moses or the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the hours and minutes and seconds and nanoseconds that make up this time. Lord, when we hear, do not steal, it seems pretty self-explanatory. And we know not to steal. We know not to take things from others. We know to do hard work and to make our money and to get things that we can afford. And so, Lord, help us to seek your justice when it comes to not stealing. Help us to always have an eye out 
for those who do not have what is needed to live. Help us to be compassionate and merciful, sharing the love of Christ. Lord, thank you for Jesus not taking that away from us, but instead giving all that he had for us as a free gift so that we might accept your love and know that is true, so that we might know of your great forgiveness and your mercy, and so that we might choose to live our time each day within your grace that we find in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to be more responsible with this grace. And at the same time, help us to be thankful and to rejoice and to share and at times to sacrifice so others may know of your great abundant love. Lord, continue to work in our hearts. Continue to shape us and mold us into who you have created us to be so that we might bask in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. This is our time of commitment. How might you respond to God? Stand and join us as we sing My Shepherd Will Supply My Need.
few, let's see, a few weeks ago, Randy and Cheyenne and Kelly came and met with me, and we had a good conversation. And in our talk, Randy and Cheyenne, we talked about faith and what it means to follow Christ Jesus, make him Savior of our lives. And so this morning, Cheyenne and Randy, they come forth to pronounce to you all that they're choosing to follow Jesus Christ, that they have accepted him in their hearts, and they're making this journey alongside the rest of us. So uh, the plan is to have a baptism next Sunday and to celebrate what this means. So we are, it, it excites me and it causes me to have great joy today. If this excites you and you're filled with joy, can you say hallelujah? <laughs> hallelujah. And as Randy and Cheyenne's church, you've always been and you'll continue to be. If you affirm to walk alongside your new brother and sister in Christ, to hold them up when they need someone, to celebrate with them in the good moments and joys of life, to pray for them when they need your prayers, would you say amen? Amen. 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 So, Randy and Cheyenne, I want to ask you both to stay up here after I say our final prayer so people can come by and celebrate with you. That would be fine to sit down. Yes. I want you to know that I know these times are different, uh, where we are at with everything with church. But this is what it means to walk alongside Christ and to proclaim that with our brothers and sisters, our church family. And so know that if any of you here have questions about faith, what it means to profess Jesus Christ in your life, if you feel that you need to talk some things out or sort some things out, come see me and we'll make an appointment to do that. We'll, we'll have a meeting together and talk. Okay, so this is a high and holy day, and we are grateful. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we rejoice with Randy and Cheyenne. We are here to support them and just to celebrate with them with this decision that they're making and to be baptized, to enter those waters and know that you're with them all the way. Lord, may you help us to look within our lives and to, uh, to evaluate our walk with you. And Lord, I pray that if there's others here today, that they will seek to have a conversation, to ask more about faith, and to know what it means to follow Christ. Lord, may you watch over Randy and Cheyenne. May you be with their families. Lord, may you bless us and keep us. May your face shine upon us and may you be gracious towards us. May you lift your countenance upon us and give us the true utmost peace that comes through Jesus Christ, the one who gives his life so we might have life abundant and free. It's in Christ's name. All God's children said, Amen.